Good morning. As we, good morning. As we continue our series on the great truths and foundations of the Reformation, uh, it's my privilege this morning to introduce our guest speaker, Matt Layton, sitting here on the front row looking excellent. Um, Matt is a dear friend. He's a missionary serving in, the, uh, in Barcelona, Spain, uh, sent out by Grace Bible Church, a fellow Bible church, a, a fellow fire church in Escondido, California. And he's married to his wonderful wife, Nuria. And they have five children, uh, Dan, John, Tanya, Alex, and Mark. Uh, Matt is a Colorado native uh, growing up in Georgetown. I grew up there. And uh, God saved him in his uh, college years, brought him to Christ. And ever since that time, uh, Matt's life has been about the gospel. It's been about getting trained and, and, and preparing for ministry and then entering into the ministry and serving in, uh, in Barcelona. He currently uh, is a graduate of Westminster Seminary, currently serves as the professor of New Testament and hermeneutics at the Evangelical Seminary of Spain, and he's also the dean of students there, and he serves as a pastor and elder at the local church there outside of Barcelona, where he oversees the teaching ministry uh, of the church. Matt and Nuria are a, a dynamic duo of ministry and labor and are just faithful in their family and in the church and in the seminary and have just been laboring there for 15 years. And I forgot to mention, just recently celebrated 20 years of marriage, correct? 20 years anniversary, just recently. And uh, what stands out to me and what I want to commend him to you uh, this morning as he comes to preach on Sola Fide is that uh, Matt is uniquely gifted, I think, in this way. God has given him uh, a real depth of scholarship in the scriptures. He has plumbed the depths and has studied deeply and is well-trained and understands uh, the deep things of the scriptures. He has, uh, I think, uniquely been given, a, been given a big brain for the scriptures, but with that, uh, an even bigger heart a heart that loves people, that be believes the love of God for himself, and then manifests that uh, to his students, to those in the church. And, and my family and, and me personally have been richly blessed uh, by Matt over the years. So I want to pray for you and then invite you to come and preach the word to us. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for our time together uh, this morning uh, to come and worship you for this glorious gospel that you have brought us into uh, as you have given us this great gift of faith. Thank you for the Leightons. Thank you for the time that we could spend with them together as Matt comes to preach your word to us. Uh, we pray for their ministry there in Spain. Thank you for the, the, the years and the legacy of faithfulness that you are leaving there and also the future. We pray that you would bless them abundantly as they serve there in the church and the seminary, as they continue to raise their children and point them to Christ. Uh, we pray that you would give them strength and great faith uh, for what is yet to come. And Father, for our time together this morning, we pray for Matt. Uh, thank you for how you have gifted him uh, as a teacher and a preacher. And we pray now for him as he comes that you would strengthen him and give him words to say to encourage our hearts to fix our eyes upon Christ, that we might be encouraged, that we might be built up in this faith and, and, and charged to press on uh, in this life of faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Right, come on. Good morning. Pleasure to be here with you this morning. I wasn't nervous when I walked into the building, but after that introduction, I maybe am just a little bit. Can I live up to those expectations, the big brain? <laughs> I don't know. We'll see how it goes. But you know, Brian, before you leave, I appreciate you saying that I look good. You look pretty good yourself, bro. <laughs> well, what I don't understand is how you can be up here without a coat or a tie. I thought that was just basic. Next time I come, I'm going to dress down a little bit so I can look young like Brian. We're going to talk about justification by faith alone this morning, and the title of the sermon is Justification by Faith Alone, the Heart of the Evangelical Faith. And I want to start off with an idea, um, kind of an illustration that I read in a book by Tom Schreiner. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Tom Schreiner. He has a book out called Faith Alone. It's excellent. I read it this spring. And the way he starts off the book is like this. He says that there's lots of religions in the world, and if you're walking down the street and you stop somebody and you ask them, so what do you think about all the world religions? Are they the same? Are they different? What are most people going to say? Most people are going to tell you that, oh, all the big religions in the world are basically the same. At the end of the day, they all lead to God. 
But you don't have to study very much. If you just do a superficial study of the major world religions, you find out pretty quickly that they're all quite different. They have very different ideas about who or what God is, about the nature of the world that we live in, about humanity. So in the midst of all this diversity, we can ask the question, what distinguishes evangelical faith, evangelical or Protestant belief from all these other world religions? Now, we would do well to answer that question with the five solas that you're considering in this series. I think it was Pastor McMillan last week who said that the five solas are like a line in the sand. They're, they, they express, they summarize very clearly the distinctives of evangelical faith. What makes us different from all the world religions? The five solas are a great, great way to start to answer that question. But what if I were to ask you to choose just one of those solas? one that is most starkly, distinguishes most starkly evangelical belief from other world religions? That's, that's a hard question. But I would suggest to you this morning, and, and here I'm, I'm standing on the shoulders of Tom Schreiner. He's a giant. I'm a midget. He suggests that the doctrine that most distinctly sets us apart from other religions is the doctrine of sola fide, faith alone, justification by faith alone. Why is that? Think about this with me. What sets us apart from, we could start with, the Eastern religions? Well, we believe in a personal God who created the world out of nothing. And that's true. That doctrine sets us apart from Eastern religions. But guess what? The Muslims believe that too. So how can we distinguish ourselves from, from the Muslims? Well, we could say that the Bible is the only inspired, infallible inerrant word of God, our only word from God, our only source of ultimate authority. And you heard a sermon about that a couple of weeks ago. That's true, but guess what? The Jehovah's Witnesses believe that as well. So how can we distinguish ourselves from the Jehovah's Witnesses? The Trinity. Okay, yep, God is one, but he also exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, we've distanced ourselves from the Watchtower, but guess what? The Roman Catholics affirm the Trinity as well. So at the end of the day, what are we going to do to distinguish ourselves from all these other religious systems, all these other religious ideas? Again, I would suggest that we would do well to choose the doctrine of sola fide. And let me say it to you this way. Sola fide is the private property of evangelical belief. Okay? I want you to hold that idea in your mind because we're going to come back to it later. I'm not, I'm, we're not trying to exclude people. We're going to invite people to come and live on this private property with us, you see. But it is counterintuitive. It is not programmed into our system as human beings. It comes from the outside. It's the gospel that we have to hear. It is not found. There's nothing like it in any other world religion. Not only is there nothing like it in any other world religion, it is the only path established by God for sinful and rebellious human beings to be, store, to be restored in friendship with their creator. It is the only way that private property that I'm telling you about is the only safe place to live. It is the only place in which we can find salvation and acceptance with our God. Sola fide. Faith alone. That's an abbreviation, by the way. It's an abbreviation for a slightly longer phrase, justification by faith alone. And that's the doctrine that I want to talk about with you this morning. And I would suggest to you that it is at the heart of the evangel. What's the evangel? The gospel, the good news. Evangel, that's where our name comes from, evangelicals. We're people who are about the good news. What is the good news of the Bible? I would suggest to you that bottom line, the good news of the Bible is justification by faith alone. So we need to define this doctrine and how are we going to do it? I, I, I think maybe the best way to get into this is first of all, to define the word justify. It's a little bit confusing because we use the word justify, don't we? Usually when you're arguing with someone and they start making excuses, you say, quit justifying yourself. That's how we use the word. We talk about justifying ourselves. If I justify myself, what am I doing? I'm presenting arguments. I'm presenting evidences to try to prove my innocence. But I'm doing it for myself. Do you see? That's how we use the word. And that's fine. But what we need to understand is when we see that same word, justify, or justification in the Bible, 
It's used in a different way. It refers to something else. So I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Romans 5, verse 1. We're going to look at how the word justify is used in this verse. And we're going to see that here and in most other places, it's used in a different way. Okay? The word justify translates a word in the Greek. If you're studying Greek and you really want to know, the word is dikaio. The word justify, trans, justify translates this word, but we find that it's used differently in the Bible than how we normally use it. Romans 5.1 says the following. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what I want you to notice is, can we do just a little bit of grammar this morning? Have you all had your coffee? Maybe, and a donut, maybe? So you get the sugar and the caffeine working together, you're ready. Okay, <laughs> amen. <laughs> Justify here is in the passive form, right? It doesn't say, therefore, since we have justified ourselves, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It says, we have been justified. You see, justification is something that somebody else does for us. We don't justify ourselves, as we see here in Romans 5.1. Who's justifying? Who's doing it? It's not me. It's God who justifies. God is the one who, here's justification, legally declares me to be in the right, to be righteous. It's a legal, let me throw one more word at you, forensic. This isn't hard because I know some of you are watching CSI and other shows Forensic evidence. What's the forensic evidence? That's the stuff that you can show in a court of law. It's legal. So what God does as a judge when he justifies, he emits a verdict about you, about me. And he says, you are righteous. You are in the right. You are just. That's what justification is. But we have a problem, don't we? Who does God justify? Initially, wouldn't we expect God to only justify good people? I mean, after all, God's omniscient. And he knows everything that I've done. He knows everything that you've done. He's also perfectly just. He himself is righteous. Wouldn't we expect him to only justify good people? Shouldn't he declare as righteous only people who behave, people who walk the straight and narrow, people who've got all their ducks in a row, Shouldn't he justify only those people? And if that's the case, we've got a really big problem. Now, last week, Pastor McMillan read from Romans 3, verses 10 through 12. And we're going to read those, those verses again because they tell us whether or not, if God were to look out on humanity, would he find anybody that's righteous? In and of themselves, are there human beings anywhere who God could declare as righteous? on the basis of what they've done. Romans 3, 10 through 12 says this, As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. Not one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. So much for justification, right? When God looks out, omniscient judge, who does he find that he can declare righteous in and of themselves? Absolutely nobody. Why? Because what do we do constantly? We offend each other and we offend our holy creator God. And you may think this morning, well, you know, I mean, you know, I'm kind of doing all right. I got, uh, you know, okay, maybe externally you've been able to put up a front, a bit of a show. But remember, God is omniscient. He sees not just what you're doing. He hears every single word you say, even in private. And not only that, he knows the inner dispositions of your heart. Can anybody say that even your best works that you've done in your life aren't tainted by some selfishness, by some pride, by some jealousy, envy, hatred? God sees all these things. And what does he say? None is righteous. Now, if we were to stop reading there, it would be a very sad morning. There's no justification for anybody. So what do we have to do? We have to keep reading, right? Right? And we read through Romans 3, read on into Romans 4, and in Romans 4, 5, we find something that completely surprises us. Absolutely amazing. Romans 4, 5 encapsulates the gospel. 
Romans 4, 5 says this. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. What? Did you hear that? Let's read it again. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Wow. According to the Bible, God, he does justify people. He doesn't justify good people because he can't find any. He justifies the ungodly. He declares as righteous people who deserve the exact opposite. Ungodly people who deserve condemnation. That's the declaration that they deserve. He declares them to be righteous. Now, if you're with me, you're sensing there's, there's a problem still. How can this be? For God to declare somebody who's, God who's perfectly just, to declare me, I'm perfectly rotten, for him to declare me righteous, doesn't that violate his character? Doesn't that go against his own justice, his own principles? How can he justify rebellious people? There's a solution to that problem, and it's called imputation. Does that word sound familiar to you? Imputation. See, if God didn't do something else, he would be breaking his own rules when he justifies us. I mean, imagine a human judge sitting in a court. It's not hard to imagine because this kind of thing happens all too often. He's got somebody in front of him, some dude who's guilty of murder, and it's clear. All the evidence is on the table. All the arguments have made. Everybody in the courtroom can see that this guy's guilty, and the judge says, oh, don't worry about it. You're a good man. You can go on your way. What would we say about such a judge? This is corrupt. We would be outraged. But you see, if God doesn't do something else, that's exactly what happens when he justifies us. He has to do something else to make it right. We find a clue for what that something else is in Romans 5.1. Because it says that we've been justified by faith and Paul goes on to say, through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there's somebody else in the picture. It's not just me. When God justifies me, he's not looking just at me. There's somebody else there. And that somebody else is the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus is the key to justification. And he's the one who makes it so that, as we read in Romans 3, God could be just and the justifier of the ungodly at the same time. Jesus has to be there. He has to be in the equation. What does Jesus do exactly? Well, let's go to 2 Corinthians 5.21. Got you bouncing around this morning. It is not the technologically savvy people in the church's fault that you're bouncing around. I should have sent an outline, maybe with some verses, could have projected it on these beautiful screens that are all black right now. Sorry. Hope you all brought Bibles on your phone or however. 2 Corinthians 5.21. What does this verse say? Paul says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Or we could flip that around depending on your translation. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Okay, sometimes different translations in a different order. I'm reading out of the ESV. We'll start again. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now this is a really thick verse. I would happily preach a sermon of 45 minutes or more just on this. So I'm going to try to unpack it really quickly. Let's see how we do here. Jesus was perfectly righteous. If there was ever a human being in history who did not deserve to die for his own sin, it was Jesus Christ. Never disobeyed. Paul says that he knew no sin. That sounds a little strange because you're thinking, well, Jesus knew about sin, right? I mean, he knew more about sin than I do, and he knew that all the people around him were sinful. He knew about sin, but that's not what Paul says. Paul says he knew no sin, and that word know here refers to an intimate knowledge. It's the same word that's used to talk about God knowing us. He doesn't know just about us. His intimate knowledge of us. Jesus did not have intimate knowledge of sin. Why? Because he never committed it. 
He never knew sin in his being. He was perfect. He knew no sin. And yet, Paul says, God made him to be sin. That sounds strange too, doesn't it? What does he mean by that? Does it mean that somehow he converted Jesus into a sinner? No. Jesus is perfect, even when he's dying on the cross. But when he's dying on the cross, God is treating him as if he were the most horrible sinner in history. Do you see that? He who knew no sin, had never committed a sin, never experienced any sin, died on the cross. God gave him over to die as a condemned man and poured his wrath out on him as if he had sinned all his life long. How can that be? That's not fair. Well, there's one more thing in this verse. Paul says it was for our sake. Jesus didn't do it for fun. He did it for us in our place. What does this mean? This means that when Jesus is hanging on the cross and he's suffering under God's wrath, God is treating him as we deserve to be treated. And it's thanks to that that God can forgive us. But you see, that's only half of the equation. We haven't finished the verse, have we? He did that so that we might become the righteousness of God. The righteousness of... How is the righteousness of God? Is it partial? It's perfect, isn't it? Anybody here doing perfect righteousness this morning? Anybody pulling it off? Well, how in the world can I become perfect righteousness? There's only one way, and here's the parallelism. When Jesus is on the cross, God is treating him as I deserve to be treated. But yet, when I'm trusting in Jesus, God is treating me as Jesus deserves to be treated. Do you see? So there's this exchange. This is imputation. God takes my sin, and he lays it on Jesus... And he takes Jesus' righteousness and he gives it to me and he accepts me perfectly as a result. I'll give you an example. I heard this example from R.C. Sproul, I think, years ago and it stuck with me. It's really good, all right? At least I think so. We'll see if it's helpful for you. Imagine a bank where there's accounts and the accounts are full, not of money, but of righteousness. Or maybe they're not so full. I get online to check my account balance I get in there, how, am I, how, how am I doing? How's my balance? Well, there's numbers in my account, but they're all red. I'm in debt. I've been unrighteous all my life. That's my account. Well, thanks be to God, like we said earlier, there's somebody else in the picture. Jesus has an account in this bank too. Get online, check his account balance. How is it? Perfect righteousness. What happens? When I trust in Jesus... Two imputations, it's a great exchange. God takes the red numbers out of my account and he puts them in Jesus' account and he pays my debt. That's not all he does. He also takes the positive, perfect righteousness in Jesus' account and he puts it in my account. I'll say it to you this way. Now, don't cut the recording off, please, when I say this. This is going to sound really bad, but but it's true. We have to understand it. Justification is by works. Whose works? Not mine. That's right. Salvation is by works. You have to deserve to be in heaven. We say, why why do people go to hell? Well, they deserve to be there. If hell is deserved, isn't heaven deserved too? Yes. But who deserves heaven? Only Jesus Christ. And he deserves it in my place. The only way I can get into heaven is if I'm holding Jesus' hand when he goes. He's the only one who deserves to be there. Now, this is great news, isn't it? Okay, so I said salvation is by works. Not our works, somebody else's works. And how are those works? They're perfect. It's great. As a result of Jesus' righteousness, I enjoy all the heavenly blessings because he deserved every single one of those blessings for me. I have a right to them because Jesus has a right to them. But you know what? Not everybody participates in those blessings, do they? Who are the ones who participate? According to the scriptures, only those who have faith. Now here we're coming to sola fide, faith alone. Go with me to Galatians 2.16. A few pages over towards the back of your Bible. Galatians 2.16 Paul says the following, very similar context to Romans. He says, 
We also, he's referring to other Jews who believe in Jesus, we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. You see, justification is by faith. Works of the law, roughly synonymous to our obedience, to our effort, that's not going to justify anybody. We'll talk about why in a minute. Justification is by faith. What is faith? Now, here's where I blew it, because the scripture reading this morning was out of Hebrews 11. What was I thinking? The classic passage about faith. We should have gone to Hebrews 11. I don't have it in my sermon, but I'm going to stick it in there just a little bit. Faith is trust, confidence, dependence, receptiveness. Do you see? Faith is an attitude It's a disposition before God where we're saying to God, I can't do it. I need you to do it for me. And I'm certain, as Hebrews 11 says, that Jesus can do it for me, that he does it for me. That's faith. Faith says, I can't do this. But Jesus, I believe that you can. And what faith does is it unites us to Christ so we share in all his blessings. I'll give you another example. This one is from Luther, but I'm I'm adapting it a little bit, all right? Um, I asked this morning if if I could do my Luther impersonation and walk down the aisles, you know, but they said that because of the video, I got to stay here, so sorry. But I am going to put this little Luther example in there because I think it's really good. Luther said, imagine a woman, and we'll update this to the 21st century, a woman who's really poor. She's in debt, up over her eyebrows, mortgages, car payments, credit card debt with ridiculous insurance uh, uh, interest rates she'll never pay it off she's lost in debt what is the best way for her to solve her problem she got to marry a rich man because what happens she marries a rich man they're united to each other in their marriage and her debt is now his and he pays it And his riches are now hers, and she becomes wealthy. They're united to each other in marriage. Do you see? That's what Luther said. Now listen, what is faith in all of this? Faith is that poor, debt-ridden woman grabbing her husband's hand and holding on, saying, honey, you've got to help me. That's what faith is. Faith is grabbing on to Jesus' hand, and it's now and at the last day standing before God saying, I know I don't deserve to be here, but he does, and I'm with him. And I'm holding on. That's faith. Okay, so we're almost done with the explanation of sola fide, and I still have time, so there's going to be more. But we've got to say one more thing. Sola fide. So we're doing Latin, right, these weeks? You guys doing some Latin? Latin Sunday school? No? Just in the sermon? Okay, sola fide. Fide is faith, and sola is alone. Right? So we've been talking about faith, but we haven't really hit on that word alone yet. Why is that in there? That was to emphasize that justification is by faith alone. And that means we only trust only in Jesus. That's it. The alone magnifies and exalts Jesus. The alone says that all I'm doing is trusting in him because he did everything that was necessary. So, Back to the holding hands example. It's not like, so the wife is holding her husband's hand with one hand. On the other hand, she's going to get a second job, you know, just in case maybe the husband doesn't have enough money. No. All she's doing is holding on. And in the same way, standing before God, you're holding on to Jesus. You don't, you don't stand before God with, in your other hand, a backpack full of good works like, oh, if Jesus doesn't have enough resources, well, I've got a little more to help. Do you see? You're empty-handed you got that one hand and all you're doing is holding on to Jesus. Only to Jesus. Justification by faith alone. Sola fide. Now, we've explained the doctrine, but not everybody agrees with what I've just said. I, I, I think it's simple. I, it's counterintuitive. Who would have thought that God would justify me for what somebody else did? That's what the Bible says. Not that hard to explain. Jesus died and he obeyed in my place. Both. God treats him as I deserve to be treated, treats me as he deserves to be treated. Simple, 
but it's very controversial. There's lots of people who don't agree with what we've just explained. There's lots of objections that have been brought against it, and I want to just really quickly run through four objections to this doctrine because I think it's going to help us understand better what it is that we believe as evangelicals, and hopefully it'll help us to better answer other people who come at us with objections to this doctrine. First of all, is justification punctual or is it a process? So two P words to make it more memorable. Okay? Is it punctual? Does it, is it a, an event that happens in a moment or is it a process? You see, Roman Catholic dogma treats that it teaches, excuse me, that justification includes a process. Roman Catholics, what will they say to you? Yes, God justifies, he declares that you're righteous, but he can only declare righteous people who really are in and of themselves, and so therefore justification must include a process of moral renewal where God helps you become better and finally deserve that verdict of righteousness. Do you see? And you know, there's, there's a certain logic to that teaching, but the, the problem is that that's not how the word justify is used in the Bible. It's just not used that way. So let's go back to Romans real quick. Romans 8, 33 and 34. I want to show you, this is, I'm not just saying this, this is actually in the scripture. We need to see how the Bible uses words and build our doctrine as precisely as we can on the basis of that. How does the Bible use the word justify? I would suggest to you that it never includes any sort of process. It's a declaration, and it's instantaneous. It's punctual. Look with me at Romans 8, 33 and 34. Here's what it says. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. There's our word. Who is to condemn? There's another interesting word. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. At the right, he's at the right hand of God. He's interceding for us. So, in this passage, we have two terms that are, that are parallel. Justification, condemnation. Justify, condemn. Do you see? They're, they're, they're parallel in this passage. They're not synonyms. In fact, they're, they're antonyms. They're opposite, but they're in parallel. Now, judges do both of these things. Judges condemn. Judges justify. When a judge condemns, what does he do? All he does is look at the evidence that's before him and pronounce his verdict. His verdict is, you're guilty and you deserve punishment. Does the judge enter into the guilty person's life and morally transform him to make him worse than he really is? No. He just looks at the evidence, you're guilty. The exact same thing is true for justification, but it's the other way around. When a judge justifies, he doesn't go into a person's life and I'm going to morally transform you and reform you so that you're good enough to to deserve the verdict, all he does is look at the evidence and say, righteous and deserving of reward. That's all he does. That's how justify, the word justify is used in the Bible. So you see, justification is punctual. It's, it's an, an event that happens in a moment, and it's external. It's something God does outside of us, not in us, outside of us. But um, may I say real quickly, that we evangelicals do believe in internal transformation, don't we? What, what, what do we call it in our doctrinal discourse? Discourse, Sanctification. I'm hearing a lot of s for sanctification. That's right. That's right. Does sanctification occur before or after justification? After. Okay, so Roman Catholic dogma, simplifying, is you get sanctified, and if you get good enough, then you're justified. But we believe that the Bible teaches the, the exact opposite. First, you're justified, and because God accepts you, now you're his friend, he's going to sanctify you. You have to be justified first, or it doesn't work. So we do believe in moral renewal, but it happens after justification, which has massive implications for the Christian life, which we'll talk about at the very end. But we're still, we're not out of the controversy woods yet. All right, so, <clears throat> sola fide, according to its reformational roots, includes the imputation of Christ's righteousness. Because if God's going to declare me righteous, somebody else has to obey in my place because I'm not getting it done. All right, we've already talked about that. So, of course, Roman Catholics deny that. But you know what? There's a lot of evangelicals and Protestants who deny it too. Did you know that? 
there are quite a few, an alarming number, in fact, of members, for example, of the Evangelical Theological Society who would say that the imputation of Christ's righteousness by faith is just not in the Bible. It's just not there. That's what they say. And they're kind of right because if you're looking for a verse that says just this, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the merit of his obedience is imputed to me by faith, if you're looking for a verse that says that, you're not going to find it. It's not there. But you know what? If you're looking for a verse that says God is one in one sense, and in another sense, he's three, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, he's triune, you're not going to find that verse either, are you? Why do we believe in the Trinity? Because we read all these passages and we see that we're forced to come to this logical conclusion, well, God must be triune. He's one, but yet at the same time, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit all share in the divine attributes. So we come to the conclusion, there must be a trinity, and we're right. God wants us to come to that conclusion. The exact same thing happens with imputation. There's passages that don't make any sense if you don't presuppose imputation. I'll give you an example, Philippians 3. If you want to turn to it with me, Philippians 3. Other texts that we've read also would lead us to this logical conclusion. But Philippians 3, I think, is a really clear example of a passage. Paul's not going to use the word imputation in this passage, but it's exactly what he's talking about. And I think we have to, that, have to come to that conclusion or the passage doesn't make any sense. So, Philippians 3, you're familiar with the passage. Paul goes on to list this, um, this just amazing list of all his moral and religious achievements to the point where he says, I was blameless. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that even on one of my good days. And Paul says, according to the Jewish system, I was blameless. I mean, he was doing pretty good. But what did he say? After he came to know Christ, everything changed. His perspective radically changes. Philippians 3, starting in verse 7. But whatever gain I had, all that obedience and all that merit that I thought I'd accumulated, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, and here it comes, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Do you see? I suggest he's talking precisely about imputation. He doesn't use the word. But what does he say? I want to be found. And he's talking about on judgment day. When I'm standing before God, I don't want to stand before God with my own righteousness. That stuff's rubbish. That's worthless. I want a righteousness. It comes from God. It's not mine. And he has to give it to me. And I receive it. It's a gift. I receive it by faith. What else is that besides the imputation of Jesus Christ's obedience, dignity, deservedness to our account. That's the only thing it could be. If, if, you're, if you're wondering, you said mental exercise, go home and try to read this passage some other way. I mean, you just got a shoehorn. It just doesn't work. But if you presuppose the imputation of Christ's righteousness, it makes perfect sense. A few other passages, we're not going to look at them. Romans 4, 1 through 8. 23 through 25, if you're taking notes, Romans 4, 1 through 8, Romans 4, 23 through 25, or other passages that talk about imputation, Romans 5, 12 through 21, also, I think, really clear, 1 Corinthians 1, 30, and 2 Corinthians 5, 21. So, one objection, justification is a process, not just a declaration. We've said no, in the Bible, justification refers to a declaration Legal, divine. Second, people deny imputation. Answer, there's a number of passages in the Bible that presuppose it and force us to that logical conclusion that God imputes Christ's righteousness to us. Third objection. Some people say um, that, well, if justification is by faith, maybe God accepts us just because of our faith. So you see... Uh, well, God knows that we can't really obey enough. And so what he does is he lowers the standard. He lowers the bar and he says, I'm only asking one thing of you. I want you to believe. Can you do it? 
And if you can pull that off, then your faith, God takes that as if it were perfect obedience. You ever heard anybody say that? People say that. You could see where it comes from. Genesis 15, 6, Abraham's faith was counted to him as righteousness. So some people take that to mean that God took him as righteous because his faith was righteousness. But what's the problem with that? That means that Abraham was justified because of something he did. Do you see? Now, the Bible never says that God's going to lower his bar. God is gracious. He's merciful, but he's not merciful by lowering the bar so that we can somehow get over it. The Bible never says that. You know what the Bible does say? God's perfect, and so he expects us to be perfect as well. Justification is not by the works of the law. Those who are of the works of the law, Galatians 3.10, they're going to be condemned. Why? Because they don't do everything that's written in the book of the law, Galatians 3.10. James 2.10, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. Do you see? The bar is extremely high. It's impossible. It's perfect obedience. It's not just doing your best, you see. Or it's not just having faith. No. God's not going to accept us just because we believe. Let me say one more thing about this. Faith is not a work. This is some, sometimes people get confused because, well, faith is something that I do. It's my faith, and that's true. God gives us faith as a gift, but I exercise it. So does my faith somehow make me worthy? Does it somehow pay for the blessings that God's giving me? No. And the reason why is because faith precisely says to God, it's not me. I need you to do it for me, like we said earlier. Imagine a beggar sitting on the ground. And somebody comes by, somebody benevolent, wants to give him a gift, wants to give him a sandwich. What does the beggar do? He extends his hand empty, and he takes it. That's how he receives it. That's faith. Extending an empty hand. But what if that beggar extended his hand, put some cash in there to pay for that sandwich? Do you see? Then it's no longer a gift. Faith is the empty hand that we extend, again, to grab onto Jesus to receive all of his blessings, we don't work. Place of works. Now, fourth objection, and you've heard this one. If you've ever been witnessing to a Roman Catholic, to a Jehovah's Witness, to a Mormon who kind of knows their stuff a little bit, and you start talking about justification by faith alone, what text are they going to throw at you? You're going to go to James, and they're going to read James 2.24. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And, and depending on how the debate's going, they'll throw a zinger, bam, home run, man, a body slam. I just took you out. Like, for 500 years, Protestants and Reformed people haven't thought about this passage. What well, got you surprised? Well, I will say this. If you're talking with somebody and they throw that out at you, maybe you'll get a little nervous because it does seem to say exactly the opposite of what I've been teaching so far. Justification by works, not by faith alone. But you know what? Protestant Christians for 500 years have been studying James 2 and have incorporated that into their doctrine of justification. And it's not hard. All you got to do is take a deep breath and just read the context. That's all you got to do. Who's Paul dealing with? Paul's dealing with people who think they have to do something to contribute to their justification. And so he's saying it's not by works, not by works, not by works. But when you read in James, you see that the problem is something different. There's something else going, in, going on in that congregation that he writes to. James 2.14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Do you get it? You, we could also translate this. Can that kind of faith save him? The kind of faith that says it believes and then there's no works to go along with it? No. What's James' point? James' point is that an empty profession of faith, somebody, a lot of words, yeah, I believe, and then their life doesn't reflect the truth of that profession at all, that person doesn't even have real faith. That's the problem. And the Reformers understood this. Calvin said, this is really profound. Calvin, you see, I've, I've gotten so Luther, Calvin, and I need to squeeze Spurgeon in there somehow, but we're doing, you know, reform things. So Calvin, what does Calvin say? He says, 
The same heart that is willing to trust in Christ is also willing to obey Him. The same heart that is willing to trust in Christ is also willing to obey Him. Why? Because if I really believe in Jesus, I believe that He is all good, He is all wise, and if He tells me to do something, it's for my good. I want to do it. Do you see? If I really believe in Jesus, I want to obey Him. A person who has true faith, their life will reflect that faith, not perfectly, but there will be evidence of that faith. And so the reformer said, justification is by faith alone, but never a faith that is alone. Justification is by faith alone, but never a faith that is alone. Works, God doesn't accept us because of our works, but our works are necessary because they demonstrate the truth, the true nature of our faith, and the regenerate heart that's behind it. So just a couple points of application, and then we'll close Sola fide, faith alone, justification by faith alone, will transform our lives to the extent that we really understand it. Transforms the way that we think about God and about ourselves. I mean, if we could really get sola fide, all of a sudden God is huge. He's the one who justifies. This is a divine work. It's all thanks to Him. I don't bring anything to the table. God is huge and I am small. It transforms our attitude. I ought to live life humbly. It's not because of my righteousness. Humility before God, before other people. I ought to be joyous. Christ's righteousness is perfect. I'm accepted now, right now. It doesn't matter what happens in the rest of my life. I'm accepted. I know that I'm friends with God. And it also ought to motivate us to obey radically. That's counterintuitive. Because most people will say, well, if you you have imputation of Christ's righteousness, if all of Christ's obedience is already yours, why should you obey? Cut the moral nerve. No, not if you think about it. I'm going to give you two little things about evangelism that will help us hopefully understand this. First of all, in evangelism, how should we think about evangelism? What should we say to people? I think that one of the, the main barriers that we need to overcome when we're trying to share the gospel with people is people's misperception. Most people think that that gospel message that you're about to preach is a message about moral reform. Oh, God's going to want me to get my act together before he accepts me. That's what people think you're going to say. Now, if that's the gospel message, what happens? There's one of two short circuits that can take place. Either people think, okay, God will accept me if I'm good enough. Well, I'm doing pretty good. I haven't killed anybody, not robbing any banks, being an upright citizen. And So, you know, if there's a heaven and there's a God, he'll accept me because I'm a pretty good person. A lot of people think that, don't they? That's nothing but pride. People are blinded by their pride, you see. What else can happen? Oh, man, if I'm not good enough, God's not going to accept me. Well, the bar is too high. Why even try? And besides, by trying, I just, it takes all the fun out of my life. So forget it. And people just fall into despair. Those are the, the, the two sort of detours that people take, misunderstanding the gospel, pride and despair. What does justification by faith alone say? It answers both of these by saying, First of all, you're not nearly as good as you think. And secondly, there is hope for you because someone else was perfect in your place if you'd believe in him. So I was talking to a Mormon. Uh, We moved to Highlands Ranch just a couple months ago, back from Spain for this year. And uh, we needed some furniture, so on Craigslist, found some bunk beds. Went over to this guy's house and uh, BYU stuff all over the place. And it's like, oh, you're from Spain. My brother was in Mexico for two years. My son was somewhere two years. Oh, he's a Mormon. So I was like, i, I got to try to witness this guy. i got to say something to him. And I tried to take him to imputation. Here's, here's what I said to him. I said, do you think God is perfect? Oh, yes, yes, of course, God is perfect. All right? So do you think God's justice is perfect? Yes, yes, God's perfectly just, yeah. I said, well, if that's the case, don't you think he requires perfection from us? Silence. And I'm thinking inside my head, I was going to say to him, how's that going for you? <laughs> Maybe I should have said that. I, but I restrained myself. And I said, I was trying to pin him down, according, just, just thinking of trying to help him see his inability. I said to him, I'm a Christian, and I believe that God is helping me. The Holy Spirit dwells inside of me. He's helping me to obey. But guess what? I'm still so far from perfection. If that's God's bar, I have no hope. And so I said to him, 
Thanks be to God that Christ fulfilled all righteousness for me. So here's the point. Sola fide kills human pride and it cures our despair. And we've got to get this clear. I suggest, to the extent that it's possible, if you get to steer a conversation towards spiritual things, the things of God, the gospel, try to debunk that false version of the gospel that so many people have in their heads. Be good or God's going to get you. Because if that's, that's what they, they think they're going to hear from you. And if that's what they come away with, they'll never be saved. In fact, all that is is exactly what all the rest of the world religions say. We want to invite people to, if I can come back to this, to live on our private property. Not that it's ours, it's God's. By His grace, we're on it. It's the only safe place to be. Only by being clothed in Christ's righteousness can you stand before God now and forever and be received as a friend and participate in all his blessings. Last little thing. So when I was about to talk to this guy, I got nervous. I mean, doesn't that happen? You're, you try to share your faith with somebody. What's going to happen? I mean, is this guy going to like blow up at me in his driveway? Is he going to get mad at me? Um, rejection, tension. Well, why don't we share our faith more? For me, usually, it's because I'm afraid. What's the cure for that? You know, you get, share the gospel with a friend or family member and man, they're, they're maybe going to get mad, they're going to reject me. Why take the risk? The answer is sola fide. And here's how it works. We got we to think about it a little bit, but it, this is, I think, sola fide should motivate us. It should be an impulse to overcome our fears and obey God radically. Before I get too concerned about what somebody else is going to think of me, I need to remember what God already thinks of me. In Christ, he sees me as perfectly righteous. Before I get worried about somebody else rejecting me, I need to remember that God has already perfectly accepted me. What could be better than that? He's accepted me. I'm not fully participating in those blessings now, and things may get ugly when I'm trying to share the gospel with somebody. But you know what? Even if they get ugly and your friends and your family and your coworkers reject you, guess what? Because you're justified, all of God's promises are good for you. And one of those promises is that he'll work everything for your good. Romans 8, 28. So even if it goes south and, and somebody's mad at you and you, the friendship and it seems to be broken and lost, God will work even that for your good. Now, I'm preaching that to myself too when I chicken out. Those are the kinds of things that we need to remember. So may God grant it to us to understand sola fide more and more the implications of it for our lives and preach the gospel of justification by faith alone faithfully. Amen.